Hey, it's Tom here and welcome back to another episode of the Investing with Tom podcast. Now, in this episode, I got the chance to speak to the author of this book, Richer, Wiser, Happier, William Green. Now, William Green has been a writer for his entire career and for the past 20 years or so now, he's also merged his passion for writing with his kind of obsession for investing and wealth creation through the stock market. Uh, William has had a very long career now of interviewing some of the world's best investors, and he writes about many of the highlights and some of the best lessons that he's learned from those people uh, in this book, Richer, Wiser, Happier. So um, it was great to get the chance to speak to William. Uh, William, if you're watching, I really appreciate you taking the time to speak with me. Uh, but without further ado, let's roll the episode and I hope you enjoy. William Green, thanks so much for joining me. Uh, your book has been extremely well received, I must say, in the in the value investing world, which I'm deeply involved in this year. And I don't say these sort of things lightly, but it's easily the best book I've read in 2021. So I'm very excited to to get the chance to, to speak with you. So thanks for coming on the podcast. Uh, thank you. It's not the only book you've read in 2021, right? Uh, no, I, this is like the sole book, and you're like, yeah, no. this is a good one. <laughs> yeah, we've got a okay. number one. Well, we in can that move case, on. I'm really, excellent. In that case, I'm really happy. Thank you. I, I appreciate your 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 gen, generous generous words about my book. Yeah, and, and we've got. Um, I put a community post up up here on YouTube a, f- a few days ago to gather some questions for this episode as well, and we've got plenty. So, um, I think a lot of people are enjoying the book. So, congratulations on the success. I think it's. Oh. Um, if it hasn't already, I think it's probably going to become a classic. So, um, ah, it's, uh, thank it's, you. Yeah, it's it's a funny thing writing a book because you you spend years in this kind of void in a vacuum, and you have no idea if it's going to resonate with anyone out there. And then suddenly you're out there, and people are. Uh, sending you messages and saying I love your book and stuff and it, it so so yeah this period has been incredibly heartening it's it, it's really nice after being kind of a a secret cave dweller for the last few years suddenly to find <laughs> that it's, it's actually resonating with people mm, yeah well congratulations and I got lots of questions on the book specifically but maybe before we get into that tell us a little bit how, how about how but you became a writer in the first place Sure. I, I really wanted to be a writer pretty much from day one. I remember when I, I was probably about seven or eight, I had an uncle who said to me, William, what are, what are you going to do when you grow up? And and I, I think I surprised myself by telling him that I was going to be a writer. And and amazingly, he, he didn't tell me that he was a writer. He was a, he was a professor of politics and didn't tell me that he wrote books himself. And, and he was totally unpatronizing and just said to this little kid, well, from my judging by my friends who are all writers, what they all say is just just write as much as you can, and you'll get your voice down. And it was actually in, incredibly good advice and incredibly generous. And so, for many years, I wrote for magazines. I I, I started off. I, I I grew up in London, and then I grew, I I moved to New York when I was about, I guess, about twenty one. And I started writing for English magazines about America. So I would do these these big stories where I would do something like I would go off to Mississippi to the deep South and, and write about this guy, Byron DeLay Beckwith, who was a famous racist who had killed a great civil rights leader um, uh, called, um, called Med Gravers. And I would write a profile of this guy who sort of 20 or 30 or so years later was being tried again. And so I started off writing these kind of long narrative features very much general interest, or I would write book reviews for the spectator, which was a great old, literary and political magazine in England. Uh, and then much to my surprise, became weirdly obsessed with the stock market in my twenties. Um, m- much like you, I guess, Tom. And, yeah. and I, I think part of what happened is I, I, I happened to get like a, a, a small windfall that came when my brother and I sold this apartment that we owned together in London. And then suddenly, um, I had to actually figure out what to do with the money. And so I started just to read about the stock market. And so then suddenly my two passions, one for writing and storytelling and one for investing and uh, at least my fantasy of, of, of wanting to make money without having to do any hard work uh, just, just by, by, by buying stocks and, and placing bets. Those two fantasies, those two interests kind of came together. And, and I just was really lucky because I was writing for magazines like Forbes and Fortune and Money and Time. And so I would go off and I would interview these people who were incredible money managers. And so it was sort of feeding both interests. And because they were kind of eccentric characters, it became a, a, a real source of fascination that you could write about these incredible people, tell these great stories, 
And at the same time, I was able to kind of feed my fantasy that one day I would become, you know, super rich and would, you know, you know, would be able to sort of luxuriate on my on my winnings from the stock market. So that that was really how I ended up becoming a, a writer about investing. Yeah, I really like that. And one of the reasons I think the books resonated so much with people is, um, you know, I, I think, like you say, a lot of us are equally fascinated with some of these investors and we see, you know, the stuff that they put out publicly, we see the investor letters and we see maybe what they say in interviews, but you were able to get, I guess, a lot more behind the scenes and actually get to know these investors as as people. So what what's that experience been like for you? That's been amazing. And it, it, it really was amazing from day one. If, if I if I look back to the early years of my career as a as a writer about investing, I would do things like I, in the days after 9-11, when the stock market was going through, I think it was the greatest the greatest meltdown really since the Great Depression. Uh, I, I went off and traveled for a couple of days with Bill Miller, who was at the time probably the most famous and successful mutual fund manager of his generation. He was in the middle of a streak of beating the market by uh, for 15 years running, which is kind of unprecedented and might never be repeated. It was an extraordinary trick to pull off. And, and so around September 23rd, 24th, I was going off on his private plane, met, met him in Baltimore, where his office was, sat in on this meeting where the stock market is just melting down. And he's just quietly buying hundreds of millions of dollars worth of stocks that everyone else is terrified to own. And then I went to his alma mater with him on his private plane, which he had he had bought partly because he had this enormous Afghan wolfhound. I think uh, maybe it was an <laughs> Irish wolfhound. It, it weighed something like 110 pounds, if I remember rightly. And he liked to fly with it. So he didn't come on this trip with us. But one of the reasons why he said he had this private plane was because he liked to fly with his dog. And then... Um, you know, we went to his alma mater and, and we're there. He's giving a talk to um, to a class and we come out of the class and we go back to this kind of VIP building where he was staying. And I remember standing with him there and, and he calls his office and basically they say to him, this stock that you bought yesterday, AES, this energy company, just missed its earnings. And, it, and in this kind of really intense period where everyone was kind of panicked, it literally had lost half its value. And so it's not even lunchtime. He's just lost $50 million. And I'm standing there next to this kind of master of contrarian value investing. And he just, and he just looks sort of deadly serious. And he kind of walks or starts sort of pacing around the room and says, uh, let me see where my cash is. Let me see my cash position. And he's like, okay, let's, uh, let's buy another, I think it was another $25 million worth um, at that point. I think he basically just doubled his position that day. And he just said, let's just get it done. Let's get it done today. And I remember just seeing this and just thinking, this is so cool. It's like, here are these guys, these kind of legendary figures that you read about. And I'm actually here with this guy as the market is melting down. And I'm getting to hang out with him and see what he does at his best. It was sort of, you know, it was like the equivalent of hanging out with, you know, Michael Jordan or Tiger Woods or whatever, you know, and being on the green with Tiger Woods at the moment when, you know, he wins a championship is, is an extraordinary thing. And so I think that was part of my fascination is that I look at someone like Miller in that moment, I think, well, this guy's not only incredibly smart, but he's got a really interesting temperament. And what an icy temperament to be able to do that at a moment when, when everyone else is panicked. And I remember, I remember that day, actually, we arrive at his car I, I think it must have been a rental car because we were going back to the airport, I guess. And some some helpful student had printed out the Yahoo Finance stock chart for AES, this company that he'd just been <laughs> killed on. And his print and, and has put the, the stock chart under his windshield. And so, you know, you're watching this kind of master going through the process of losing, you know, whatever it was, $50 million or something. And placing another $50 million bet, processing it. And then I remember sitting in the car with him to the airport and he's saying, this might, this might be our biggest winner for next year. Like, like we need to go back, really do some serious work on this. And, and, and this could be our biggest outperformer next year. And so Mm -hmm. I think that for me was part of the fascination was actually to see these people up close. And so that's part of what I'm trying to do in the book is I'm, I'm trying to say to you, yeah, there are all of these lessons you can learn from people like Miller or, 
or um, Charlie Munger, who I interview, or Ed Thorpe, all of these legendary investors, Sir John Templeton. But I'm actually trying to take you into their world and say, here's what it's actually like to be with Bill Miller as, as he's getting, getting kicked and um, responding in this kind of super, super rational, pragmatic, quiet, unemotional way. Mm-hmm. Out of interest, do you recall how that how that bit ended up playing out for Bill Miller? I think it did okay, but it didn't. I, I I've never really followed up on it in a big way. But I tell you, the thing that I was focusing on most at the time that was I I I guess at the time I was writing this long profile of Bill Miller for Fortune. I'd already written a story about him a few months before for Money Magazine, where I'd been I've been trying to f- I. I'd been talking to all of these great investors about who their masters were, who their greatest influences were. And he, um, and he curiously, the reason why I was so interested in him was because his, his role models were people like Wittgenstein, the Ludwig Wittgenstein, the, the philosopher, and William James, who was a, a great pragmatic philosopher and psychologist. And, um, and, and they were teaching him all about misperception and how to, how to, how to distinguish between perception and reality. And so I was writing about how he was applying this to the stock market. And so, so when I was first interviewing him, it was pretty clear that he was doing something extraordinary with Amazon, where everybody thought Amazon was going bankrupt at the time. The stock had fallen to, uh, from, I think, $90 um, around the peak of the, the tech bubble, the tech and internet bubble in 99, 2000. And it crashed to around $6 a share. And Bill had bought um, 15% of the company. And as it was plunging, he just kept buying more. So he told me the other day, we were talking about this the other day. And he said, um, yeah, my average purchase price was $17 a share. And so, so, so I then came back from that first interview that I'd done for Money Magazine, or the first few interviews that I'd done for Money Magazine. And I interviewed him on this long trip um, in much greater depth about what he was doing with Amazon. And at the time, so I write this long profile, maybe an eight, nine page profile for Fortune. And I said in that article that if his bet on Amazon turned out to be right, it would prove to be one of the greatest contrarian bets of all time, because it was so controversial. I mean, I I remember going to an event. um, We were talking about this again last week. It was a it was a launch for Bruce Greenwald's book about value investing. Mm-hmm. And and Bill was there, and so was Seth Klarman and Mario Cabelli and Bill Ruay and all these kind of grandees of the value investing world. And and Bill sort of said nice things about uh, about this book that was being launched. And then Bruce Greenwald kind of totally rips into Bill and starts saying, uh, "Buying Amazon, this is not a value investment. I mean, it, it, you know, this company is going bankrupt." And so Bill was actually invited to rebut this because it was it was kind of I think it was kind of embarrassing almost. And I remember him talking at double speed, defending his bet, maybe triple speed. I mean, he was really under attack and he's defending mm. his bet on Amazon. And I remember him saying, if I'm wrong, I'm going to lose 100% of my money. And if I'm right, I think I'm going to make 50 times my money. And so we do know how this bet worked out because Amazon yeah. went up you know, to what, more than $3,000 a share. And and when I was writing this book, Richard Wise Happier, I talked to um, I spent a couple of days with Bill for this book, um, both at his office and his home in, in, in Maryland. And it turned out that Bill had not only kept his investment, his personal investment in Amazon all those years, but it kind of turbocharged it during the financial crisis. So while he was kind of famously getting smacked around during the financial crisis and his fund just went and had a terrible time, he actually personally was like, there is no way I'm selling this. And not only was he not selling this, but he was using options and stuff to buy, to massively increase his position in Amazon. And so he told me that basically he he looked at the proxy statement for Amazon and he said to Jeff Bezos, is your proxy statement right? And Bezos was like, yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah, no reason to think it's not. And Bill said, well, in that case, I'm the largest individual <laughs> shareholder of Amazon, who's not surnamed Bezos, other than now <laughs> Mackenzie, who is, you know, Bezos' ex-wife. Yeah. And so there was something kind of triumphant about the fact that all these years later, you know, I, I'd, I'd sort of watched Bill get this tremendous drubbing, this kind of takedown 
for having invested in Amazon, this company, this profitless bookseller that everyone knew was going bankrupt. And all these years later, between between Amazon and Bitcoin, I, I said to him, so you, are you a billionaire now? And he's like, yeah. And I said, are you a multi-billionaire now? And he said, let's just leave it at that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he didn't you want to say talk that. about it anymore, whether it's through <laughs> modesty or whatever. But I thought yeah. that was pretty fascinating that... Um, so, so, so I'm not really sure about AES, but it's been amazing to see that that Amazon has turned out to be one of the greatest contrarian bets of all time. I would say, mm-hmm. yeah, for sure. And, and um, it sort of goes to show how you know if you make a handful of big, big bets, you really only have to be right on maybe one or two of them to make an entire career. I mean, you you write quite a bit about Nick and Zach. I think the, the chapter is called Nick and Zach's Excellent mm. Adventure. And they bet on the yeah. same company, Amazon, and I think wound up the fund owning something like three stocks. Can you can you talk us through that experience yeah. of meeting Nick yeah, Sleep? Nick because and, yeah, sure. Nick 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 Sleep and and Case Sicaria, who goes by the name Zach, um some of your some of your readers, uh, some of your listeners, sorry, will will have heard of them, but they were so far under the radar that most people mm. actually didn't really know they existed. They never did any marketing. They they never did any PR. But their fund Nomad beat the MSCI index by something like eight hundred and four percentage points over thirteen years. I mean, it was just an incredible performance, and partly it was driven by this enormous bet on Amazon. And, and there was a time I, I talked to, um, I, I mean, I, I did a lot of interviews with Nick, but there was one particular day when I, I went and hung out in their office on the King's Road in London with Nick and Zach. And we were talking about what it was like to own Amazon during the period when it was massively out of favor. And they, Nick was recalling how he went to this conference in New York. I guess this must have been very early in 2009 or might have been late in 2008. The market's melting down and George Soros was there. And here's George Soros, one of the greatest traders of all time. And Soros says, Soros is basically saying, there's going to be financial Armageddon. The whole system is melting down. And it became clear that there was one stock that he was shorting and it was Amazon. And here in Nick and Zach, they'd, they'd I think, just got permission to go from like 20% of their fund in Amazon having something like 40% because they actually had to sort of change the rules of the fund to be allowed to do that. And a quarter of their shareholders redeemed and sold the fund because they were like, there's no way we want to own a fund that's betting so much on this one crappy company that's going to, you know, that's that's getting killed. And Nick and Zach were like, no, we're just going to do it. We, we think we're right. And, and Nick met that day with Bill Miller who whose funds were getting killed at the time by redemptions um, because so many investors were panicking. So he he had bought fifteen percent of Amazon, but was having to sell to meet redemptions. And so so Nick meets Bill Miller, who had really shaped Nick's opinion that they should be going big on Amazon. I mean, Nick, Bill Bill really had had um, informed their own purchase because he he understood Amazon's competitive advantages pretty much before anyone else. And so, so Nick watches Soros say, yeah, this is the one company I'm shorting. Here's Bill, who's the biggest shareholder of Amazon saying, yeah, I'm a forced seller. And he's like, holy crap. And he phones <laughs> Zach at home in London that night um, from New York. And he says, uh, do you think we're making a mistake? And and Zach's like, no, 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 we're doing the right thing. We're doing the right thing. And Nick's like, but everyone else is going in the opposite direction. And he's like, I think we're right. You know, I think this is a company with an amazing destination that's that's going to, you know, because it has such advantages and such long term thinking and such such a great culture. I, I'm pretty sure we're going to we're going to get to a good destination. But what if we're wrong? And he said he, he basically concluded either we're brilliant or we're toast. <laughs> and I love the fact that in retrospect, everyone always thinks, God, that was such an inevitability that Amazon would have done so well. But I remember those two moments of, of Bill Miller getting eviscerated back in 2000 for, for betting on a money losing book company. And then Nick Sleep at this moment during the financial crisis, uh, having literally a quarter of his funds shareholders redeem their money because they had such a big bet on Amazon. And I, I think it, what it goes to show you is 
is that to be truly contrarian, re- really to diverge from the crowd, requires not only a kind of intellectual uh, insight, but actually tremendous fortitude. I mean, you you have to you have to really have the strength to 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 buck conventional opinion. I remember very early on when I when I was first interviewing Bill Miller on that trip for Fortune, and I said to him at one point, if you'll excuse the language, I said, "Man, you." you really got to have a lot of balls to do what you do. And he looks at me and he sort of smiles and he says, yeah, but I've also got to be right. And I think that's the real problem. It's, it's not only do you have to diverge from the crowd, but you've got to be right. And so, so I think when you look at the greatest investors, whether it's the Nick Sleeps and the Zacks or, or Bill Miller or Charlie Munger or Buffett, Howard Marks, they're extraordinary intellectually, but they actually also have this temperamental advantage that they're, they're kind of these, these, these loners and misfits and mavericks and iconoclasts who have the, the, the emotional strength to stray from the crowd. And, and so that's, I think, one of the reasons why I became so fascinated by them is because they're, they're odd ducks, right? And I, and I write about Nick and Zach as these kind of odd ducks, right? I mean, Zach wanted to be a meteorologist and his parents thought it was stupid. And so he ends up going into investing and Nick wanted to be a landscape architect and, and, you know, dreamed of designing beautiful public spaces where you could kind of go and sit in a park in the middle of a city, like, like Edinburgh and just kind of rest and, and dream about nature. And he, and he went to work for a landscape architecture firm and found he was just designing dormer windows and parking lots and stuff like that. And then they laid him off. And so, so they were like these, these kind of two outsiders who didn't really have a need to be part of the crowd. And so this is why I, I write in the chapter about Sir John Templeton, that, that one of the most distinguishing characteristics of the greatest investors is, is what I call the willingness to be lonely. And it, and it helps if you're naturally kind of an outsider. <clears throat> yeah, that's what I was going to ask. Do you think this, these are traits that just come naturally to these investors or do you think, do you think it can be learned? Well, I remember Nick saying to me that he was at boarding school at this school where, he, well, I guess everyone else was a boarder and he was a day boy. And so he was living nearby. And while they were all on this kind of 400 acre campus, I think the school was set up by Queen Victoria or something like that. It was a beautiful, beautiful campus. All the other kids are part of this, this, this herd, this tribe. And he was off at weekends and was working in a pub all weekend. And he said he just became very care- very comfortable being outside the crowd. And so I think that, so there's clearly some aspect of nurture there, but then there's definitely an aspect of nature because you see, you see the way people like Charlie Munger or Howard Marks operate, both of whom I interviewed for the book. And they're just very unemotional. I mean, Howard, Howard Marks, during the financial crisis was betting 500 to 600 million dollars a week with his with his partner Bruce Karsh during a period where the market was melting down and you know they're buying these toxic bonds investing in in companies that nobody else would touch and when i asked him if it was difficult emotionally he just sort of looked at me and it was like no i, I don't remember it being difficult at all and, and because I knew that he'd been divorced before, I asked him if he'd always been unemotional and if that was a problem in his relationships. And he's like, oh, yeah, it was definitely a problem in my first relationship. He said, I've become much better now. But so mm-hmm. I think I think there's definitely an emotional difference between the, the greatest investors and most of us. I mean, I, I can see I'm I'm much more fearful Um I'm much more neurotic, much more naturally anxious. It's hard for me to keep my emotions under control. And when I said to Charlie Munger, when, when I was asking him about buying Wells Fargo, for example, at what he called the bottom tick in March 2009, when the last thing he wanted to buy was a, was a financial company. And here he is wading in and buying a financial company for da- the Daily Journal, this, this other um, company that he, he, where he's chairman. Um, and I asked him about it and he's like, no, it wasn't difficult. No, I, I, I didn't feel any fear or any anxiety. And, and, and I said, so, so you're not really fighting those emotions because you don't feel them. And he's like, right. 
I, I don't feel them. And he said, Warren is wired very much the same way. So I think, I think that's a huge advantage if you're wired differently from the rest of us. But I, but I think there's a, there's a useful takeaway for, for people like you and me, which is you just have to be self-aware. You have to say, well, so how am I wired? Am I, am I, am I wired in a way that helps me to win this game? And you also, you don't need to have optimal wiring, um, but, but you need your wiring to be pretty good. And you, you, you need at least to know, well, during these times of tremendous turmoil, let me at least be calm enough that I'm not going to sell. And hopefully I'm going to be um, calm enough and rational enough that I'll be able to buy. But at the very least, not to sell during periods of turbulence. And, and so some of that, I think, comes from understanding the rules of the game and, and just understanding the principles that these moments of dislocation are tremendous opportunities because things get mispriced. And some of it is temperamental and it's 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 taking advantage of other people's bipolar emotions. And this all goes back to Ben Graham, right? Who said that, that, that you know, who was uh, Buffett's great teacher, who said that the, the market is, is uh, a voting machine, not a weighing machine. And so you're just waiting for Mr. Market to get stuff wrong because he's bipolar. So understanding that that's the game and that, that having to control your own emotions is key is, is, is really helpful. It's really central, I think. And, and so I think if I, if I look at someone like um, Tom Gaynor, for example, who I write about at, at, at quite a lot of length, Gaynor says he doesn't have the lack of emotion that, um, that say, Munger or Buffett has. I mean, he, he used to be on the board of Washington Post Company alongside Buffett, and knows Buffett very well. And he, he once said to me, we were once having lunch in New York at this, this beautiful club in New York. And he said, um, I think this is the first time I met him. And, and he said, look, I had hair before the financial crisis, this in 2008, 2009. And I thought he was kind of joking because he's a very self-deprecating, good humored guy. And I said, really? And he's like, no, no, really? I had hair before 2009. And I thought that was really interesting. There's a guy who's got a very superior, very long-term record over three decades, but he's actually, he's not unemotional. I mean, he's a, he's a guy who has a really happy marriage. He's married to the woman he, he started dating when he was 15. You know, he's got a great relationship with his kids. He's a lovely bloke, re- really nice, warm-hearted guy. He's not an emotional mutant, you know, who just has no emotions. And yet he still managed to be a very successful investor. And I, and I think part of that, is again, it goes back to understanding the rules of the game. And for, for him, he always had this sense that you just want to be a very, very patient investor. And so he would buy superior businesses that, that fit his four criteria for what a business needed to, um, the, the criteria that a business needed to meet. And then he would just hold on to them forever. So I think the first stock he bought when he was at Markel, the company where he's a co-CEO, um, was Berkshire Hathaway in 1989, 1990. And here he is, you know, when I last checked, I think his stake was worth something like $700 million in Berkshire. And he's just held it for, for three decades. So that's, that's an incredible temperamental advantage. So he, even though he doesn't have the emotional control, maybe of being fearless, he has the patience to, to hold on for a long time. So again, it's a, it's, it's, it's a really valuable lesson for the rest of us to, uh, to know that patience is is an extraordinarily central virtue when it comes to investing, mm-hmm. and and presumably there's I guess some um, maybe if you don't have that um, the type of wiring of someone like Bill Miller, presumably there's some I suppose some structural things you can put in place. You know, not having margin loans, maybe having your money in investments where it's difficult to liquidate quickly. Um, you know, those types of things to kind of I guess stop you from becoming your own worst enemy in, in some of these fearful situations. Yeah. How, how's that? Ha, have you taken that approach in in your own personal investing? Are there structures you have put in place to kind of align with your own wiring? Yeah, I mean, I, I because I'm so technologically inept. I I have my portfolio literally on a in a Microsoft 
Word document that I update, much to the horror of my wife, who's like, really, you, can't, <laughs> you can't use Excel. And I, like I just, uh, and, and, and at the top of this, um, this sheet, it literally has the phrase resilient wealth creation, which is, which is a phrase that I stole from Matthew McLennan, who I write about in a chapter called the, the resilient investor. And I'm trying to remind myself, I mean, it's in bold right at the top of this page. I'm trying to remind myself, I'm not, I'm not trying to overreach. I'm not, um, I'm not trying to roll the dice in the short term. I'm trying to build wealth in a resilient way. And so that means if, if you want to be, if you want to be building wealth in a resilient way, you can't be doing anything too crazy. You can't be investing borrowed money. You can't be investing money that you can't really afford to lose. Um, or at least you need to be able to ride out these periods where the market's down 10, 20, 30, 40, 50%. I mean, Berkshire Hathaway, I think, has, despite its astonishing record, has halved three times over the last half century. And Charlie Munger says that if you can't handle a 50% drawdown with grace and aplomb, um, you're probably not taking enough risk. So he said, it's just part of the game. It, it goes it goes with the game. You need to understand that once in a while, you're going to get clobbered. So I think you need to position yourself to survive an extremely uncertain future. And so one of the things, I, 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 I talked at length with Howard Marks about this, who is one of, the, one of the great investors who manages, what, $140, $150 billion at Oak Tree. And, and he said to me, it's all a question of, of how much do you push the limits? Do you um, do you not only invest in a way that that's too risky, but do you invest in a way that you find you might not be able to handle emotionally? So even as he put it, even if you don't get a margin call, or or even if you don't have problems buying bread, you might suddenly find that you actually can't handle it emotionally. You're just forced to sell because you're just a, a psychological mess. And so I think. Again, you really need to have some degree of self-awareness. So you can say, well, if the market gets killed, am I going to be okay? And will I be able to stay in the game? And, and I often, often wonder if we do a disservice to investors when we write about it as journalists or talk about it in podcasts and the like the kind of horse race aspect of beating the market by a mile. Because... For most of us, it doesn't really matter if you beat the market for a mile. You, you kind of want to reach the destination, which, which to me is resilient wealth creation. I, I just want to be financially secure and independent. So, so I don't have to do any work that I don't like. I don't have to work for anyone I dislike. Um, I can have a little bit of balance in my life. I can actually spend time with my wife and kids. Th those are the sort of goals that are really important to me. And so... I'm really happy if I can beat the market. I mean, if I do, that'll be fabulous. And I've invested in a couple of funds that thank God have beaten the market. Um, but it's not really the ultimate goal. And, and so, so yeah, I think, I think that idea of asking yourself, am I pushing the limits emotionally, psychologically, financially in ways that, that I won't be able to withstand real turmoil? That, that's that's a really important question to ask. And, and I think you also have to remind yourself that when things go wrong, they tend not to go wrong just in one area of your life. There's a sort of, there's a sod's law aspect of this where I, I, I found this in two, late 2008 during the financial crisis. There was a point where my stock portfolio was just getting killed. And at the same, at the same time, I lost my job. And the fact that I was sort of a pessimist and had been a journalist for many years and, and, you know, almost everyone I knew at some point got laid off as a journalist. So you always knew it was just a matter of time meant that I had no debt at all. And so I didn't have to sell anything during that period. And I actually was a net buyer. And, and so just positioning myself to survive these two twin disasters was enormously helpful. And I remember someone telling me that there was someone I wrote about who he went through a divorce. He had a massive uh, uh, sort of philanthropic burden where he promised a certain amount of money to a, a particular charity. 
and his stock portfolio got killed, his fund got killed all at the same time. And I just think it's it's worth it's it's worth maintaining this kind of margin of safety where you say, well, yeah, I, I want to be unfragile in multiple areas. And when when you look at someone like Birch Hathaway, you can see it's it's structured to be as as my friend Guy Spear would say, B- B- Buffett wants to be the last man standing. And so even if the market were closed for five years, Berkshire would be just fine. And so, so for example, I, I own Berkshire Hathaway stock, and it's not because I think it's going to outperform massively, although I hope that it does, but I want to survive. I want to reach the finish line. And so, mm-hmm. so that to me, I, I, think, I think just trying to be resilient is, um, is hugely important. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I really like that. I um, <clears throat> it's interesting that you talk about your your word document or how Buffett describes you know trying to build a financial fortress at Berkshire. Uh, and I have a friend actually. I'm sure I'm sure you've heard many times of sort of the coffee can investment approach. He has a mm. literal coffee can where he writes down a name of a stock that he purchases and puts it in the coffee can. So for everyone, I think they've they've got these different little quirks that that keep them going. But um, it's great. just interesting to hear different people's perspectives on that. Um, well, well I, actually, I actually wrote on that same sheet, I wrote to myself that I have a five-year no-selling rule. And so, so I literally wrote down the date when um, I would next be allowed to sell a stock. And so I'm kind of trying to force myself to own things for a long period. And, and that's hard for me. And I, I did violate it recently. And I, I, sold, I sold something because uh, I wanted to raise some cash to buy something else. But... Um, I don't know. I think the more you can push yourself towards extreme patience, the better. And and one thing that I do, I, I I've written about the fact that I invested in Guy Spears Fund something like twenty one years ago, um, mm-hmm. the Aquamarine Fund. And and one thing that I want, I mean, I've managed to hold on to it, and partly it's because we're good friends, and I don't want to violate our friendship. And so I'm actually, I, I so I'm not a hugely patient person. But I try to be kind of a loyal friend. And so I'm using that quirk in my character um, to push me towards being long term. And so I, I've said to him many times, I regard this as a 40 year investment. And, and we'll, we'll see. I mean, we're both now in our 50s. We'll see whether we're still, you know, doddering along in our 70s. And I'm still an investor in the Aquamarine Fund. But I think, again, that it all it all goes back to this line that Monish Pabre, who's a very close friend of Guy Spears said to me, which is that the, the single greatest um, virtue in investing is, is extreme patience. And I think just knowing that, knowing, knowing that you want to hang in there for a long period is hugely important, whether, whether it's buying an individual stock like, like Bill Miller with, with Amazon or, or Nick Sleep and Case Sicario, they've owned personally, they've had you know, Nick has a four stock portfolio since he, since he retired as a hedge fund manager. And he's owned Costco for many, many years, at least 18 years, and Amazon for at least 16 years. Um, that ability to hold on to your winners for a long time is a kind of superpower, I think. And it's, and it's pretty abnormal. I, I didn't write about this in the book, but there was a right I read a, a relatively short section of the book about Joel Tillinghast, who's an extraordinary investor from Fidelity. And he he still owns the first stock that he ever bought as a child. And so it's gone through many, many different iterations. It's been, it's split, it's been acquired. It's, and he still owns it after 50 something years. What, what an extraordinary temperamental advantage it, it is to be able to do that. But then again, as with Bill Miller uh, saying to me, yeah, I not only have to have balls, I've actually got to be right. You, you don't yeah. just want to own a terrible stock, a total dog for 20 years. So, so you've got to be right as well. But if you combine patience with being, being, being right, it's, it's an unbelievable superpower. Yeah, for sure. And, and I found it really interesting. Um, there was one section of the book um, on Nick Sleep about him selling Amazon. And it was really interesting to hear that Nick Sleep, you know, felt, terrible when he did that he, he must he, like he really viewed himself as kind of a long-term partner and, and owner in this business can you speak to yeah. that a little bit yeah nick finally sold half when it got to 1500 and he just had so much of his money in it he he at a certain point he i think he had more than 70 percent of his net worth in it 
and clearly had nine, nine figure net worth. So it's a very significant sum. And mm -hmm. he said, I just started to wonder about the limits of Amazon's greatness. Could it be a $3 billion company, a $4 billion company, a $5 billion company? And he's, and he didn't, he didn't say it couldn't, but he said, I don't know. And I think he had so much, um, there was so much that he wanted to do philanthropically that he didn't, that he didn't want to take the risk of not being able to do that. And so, so he sold half at 1500. So he'll still be very happy if it keeps surging, which it has obviously. Um, but he would, but he, but he wanted to be able to make an enormous difference philanthropically, which is his main focus. Now he's, he, he and Zach basically are, are, are giving most of their money back to society for Zach, Zach, let it ride. And so Zach told me he's, he still has more than 70% of his, his own net worth in Amazon. Um, and it was funny. There was one point where I think I, I was talking to Bill Miller about Nick and Zach and, and I said, uh, Zach, <laughs> I said, I said, yeah, Nick has like 50% of his net worth in Amazon. And Bill was like, really? Only 50%? <laughs> it's like slightly <laughs> dismissive. You know, I mean, he was joking. But um, but Bill Bill at one point told me, I mean, I, I, I'm a bit outdated, outdated on this, but when I talked to him months and months ago, he basically had almost all of his net worth in Amazon and Bitcoin. Uh, if I remember mm -hmm. right here, it might have been like 83% or something was in Amazon. It was an enormous amount of... And since then, um, uh, Bitcoin has done so spectacularly well that I actually think when I when I interviewed him for Barron's a few months ago, um, his Bitcoin position was bigger than his Amazon position, if I remember rightly. And, mm -hmm. and, and we were talking last week and he said that basically he started buying Bitcoin at two hundred dollars per, per Bitcoin and and his average price until this year when he made another big purchase um, was basically five hundred dollars a coin. Uh, and he still thinks, yeah, it's, it, it could still go up another tenfold very easily. So, you know, he's, he's, he's not selling. He has this incredible contrarian ability to buy stuff like Bitcoin that people, people like Charlie Munger and Buffett describe as rat poison. And it's very, it's very similar to what I saw 20 years ago when he was amassing that enormous position in Amazon. And everyone thought he was an idiot. And, and I was saying to him, is it, it, does it does it remind you of that? And he's like, yeah, same thing. He's like, they're both they're both examples of misperception where people misperceive what Bitcoin is and they misperceived what Amazon was. And so there's a kind of beautiful consistency there. And I I think with Bill, he has this. He, he's not only got this kind of thrilling intellect. He is a really beautiful mind, but but he also has this this temperamental quirk. Which is that I think I think when people he really admires, like Buffett and Munger, who, who he has tremendous respect for, when they disagree with him, it almost excites him more. It doesn't make him look at himself and doubt himself and think, God, I'm a total schmuck. I, I think the fact that everyone disagrees is almost more exciting. And mm. it's a, it's just a strange quirk. And I, I think it I think again it comes back to the fact that when it comes to investing, you want to have some self awareness. You you want to know how you're wired, and and for him, it's just not it's not a, it's not a problem when everyone disagrees. E even during the financial crisis, actually, way before that, if I think back to 1999 and 2000 when I was first writing about him, I remember the market was melting down. So actually, I guess this is 2001, right after 9/11. I remember him saying at the time that all these guys like Templeton and Prince Al Walid and Saudi Arabia were kind of bearish. They weren't buying. And he's like, so even the great contrarians aren't buying. And he's like, that's fantastic. When even the great <laughs> contrarians aren't buying, that's a buy signal. And so, so yeah, he was, he, he, he's just a great iconoclast. He's able to look at things in a totally unique and individual way, which is, which is great when you're right and terrible when you're wrong. Mm, for sure. It, it reminds me, I think this was actually a quote you mentioned in the book from Howard Marks about uh, most of the time the world doesn't end, which I think is a, yeah. a very nice approach to it. Yeah. yeah, it was a lovely observation from Howard where du during the global financial crisis in 2008, 2009, he said, he said, usually 
he looks at the world as a kind of probability distribution, which is a much fancier kind of mathematical term than I can pretend to understand. But he's basically saying there's a whole array of probabilities where this could happen. And I think there are these odds of it melting down totally. And there are these odds of it being OK. And there's a there's this kind of distribution of probabilities. But he said in that situation, it was so extreme that he said, really, it was just a simple choice. It was you were saying to yourself, is the whole system going to melt down and it's the end of the world? Or is it going to survive? In which case, we'll have failed totally if we don't buy at this moment of maximum pessimism, this, this just enormous panic. And he, and so when he said most of the time the, the world doesn't end, that was a sort of, that was a kind of jokey way of making this very bold point where he was saying, I don't think the whole system is going to melt down. And he said, he said, we were actually very close to the system melting down. Um, he said it wasn't, I mean, I, I, I said to him, when you were trying to figure out how bad could it get, he said, well, rioting in the streets, famine, um, Great Depression, more, more intense than the Great Depression. He's like, you don't really know, but it could, it could have become pretty, pretty terrible. And we didn't know um just how close to the edge we were but his view i think was that at a certain point things were so mispriced that you had to say instead of saying this is too good to be true as you would during a, a kind of bubble he said this is too bad to be true and so there was a there was a great story he he talked about where he went to see a um, an investor in one of his funds, uh, um, a, it, I, I guess it was a pension fund, if I remember rightly, the, the, it was an institutional investor. And this person kept saying to him, what do you think is going to happen if this goes wrong? And he would say, well, in the last 30 years, we've never seen anything happen like this. And but there's a possibility and this would happen. And this investor kept saying, but what if it's worse than that? What if it's worse than that? And, and anything he said, this person would just say, yeah, but what if it's worse? worse sorry and at a certain point that that was when he just kind of rushed back to his house and wrote this memo saying um it's too bad to be true and and that was when he realized that the 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 mood in the market had become so extremely bearish um that it was probably the greatest opportunity of his lifetime to buy mispriced bets and and the bets that he and bruce Cash placed during that period i i think they bet about eight billion dollars during a 15-week period and they ended up making about eight or nine billion dollars in profit. So again, as with Bill Miller and Amazon, this is one of the great contrarian bets of all time. But it was, it wasn't, it wasn't that he dismissed the possibility that the world could go over the edge. It actually, I, I, I think it probably came pretty close to melting down. And I, I remember my friend Ken Schubenstein, who I write about um, in the chapter on Charlie Munger. Ken once told me that he was. He was sitting watching TV. He, he had a hedge fund that would, had a terrible time during the global financial crisis. And he said he was sitting there watching TV one day um, to see Buffett trying to calm the market. And Buffett was sort of saying, you know, no, it's going to be OK. Like the America is very resilient and stuff. And he said when he looked at Buffett, he thought, oh, my God, Buffett is really rattled. And this thing, because he was such a close observer of Buffett, Buffett's attempt to to reassure people actually really rattled Ken because he realized, <laughs> oh my God, Buffett thinks this could be melting down, and so yeah. it was it was an intense moment, and and so you have to be able to ride through these very intense periods and and set yourself to survive all sorts of unpredictable events, whether it's pandemics, meltdowns, terrorist attacks, and and but it's a but it's a subtle balance because you have to position yourself to survive. But as but as Howard Marks said to me, at a certain point, risk avoidance becomes return avoidance. And so if you're so conservative that you're avoiding all risk, then you'll also manage to avoid all returns. And so, so this isn't a matter of being so cautious that you never take any risk. What, as, as Howard said to me, it's really about bearing risk in an intelligent manner. And so you're always looking and you're saying, what's the worst that can happen here? Can I survive? Have I positioned myself to survive? Um, 
and do the odds favor me? So is, is the downside much lower than the upside? And, and so just positioning yourself to survive catastrophe is really important, but then also positioning yourself to take advantage of these moments of dislocation, like, like the, the global financial crisis or like the early period of COVID when the market was melting down um, or that period dur during the tech bubble. You, and, and so part of it is kind of re-educating ourselves so that in you, you dread those periods, you have to actually be aware that those are the periods that set you up for many years afterwards, if you take advantage of them. So mm -hmm. it's a, it's a slight shift in mentality. Whereas I think most of us, we kind of, we, we dread bad times and, and the great, the great value investors in particular, they're just wired to wait quietly for these moments where there's dislocation and, and then grab the opportunity with what Charlie Munger calls gumption. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like it, it reminds me of, um, I think it was Buffett in the sort of stock market crash of the early 1970s. He described the prices at which you could grow, you could buy some of these great businesses as an orgasmic experience, which is not not what you'd hear a, a typical investor yeah, say he, when you've got these big downturns. Yeah, I think he. I, I used to work at Forbes, and there was a famous thing where Buffett, who wasn't then really famous, had talked to Forbes in I guess '73 or '74 or something when there was a great meltdown. And he said something along the lines of him being like a, like a, like a, like an oversex schoolboy in a, is it like a nunnery or something? It was some, <laughs> it was some kind of racy comment. And I think they may have edited and kind of changed, changed yeah. his quote, which you're not really supposed to do. But there was also a time, there was a, there was a great editor at Forbes called Jim Michaels, who I worked under. He was one of the most extraordinary journalists of our, our era. He was 77 when I worked there and uh, just an incredible guy. He, I think he was the guy who had broken the story of, of Mahatma Gandhi's assassination. I mean, he, you know, he really went back ages wow. and he was, he was a brilliant old reporter. And there was a famous cover story around that time in Business Week where Business Week wrote, did a death of equities cover. And they were basically saying, you know, you should never buy equities. This, it, literally, the cover line was the death of equities. And Jim Michaels said, um, the Lord has truly blessed us with the quality of our opposition. I thought that was a wonderfully dismissive comment about <laughs> Business Week. But he was like, you know, these are the people we're competing with. These people who at the moment when the market is getting utterly killed have decided that equities are no longer an appropriate place to invest. And, and Jim was just smart enough to know, like, like, Nah, this is this is exactly the time you want to buy, and it's so fascinating that Buffett, you know, was was so openly telling you this is a, this is a moment to buy, and still nobody could do it. And then he, he, you know, there are several times I can't remember who told me this. So some famous investor was saying to me, there there are several times when when Buffett has actually told you to buy, and still almost nobody could do it, and. It's, it shows you just how difficult it is. Theoretically, it's easy enough. And I, I look at something like Alibaba, which I, I bought a few weeks ago, and I'm, I very rarely buy an individual stock. And I was like, no, I'm not doing it anymore because I'm totally unqualified to doing it. And then I saw all of these great value investors buying Alibaba, and it immediately drops like 25% after I buy it. And it's really hard to do because you don't know, has something fundamentally changed? Do, am I wrong? Is 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 China, um, you know, the regulators really going to kill these companies like Alibaba, or are they going to, or are they really a powerful part of the 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 financial engine of the company of the country, and they want to drag people out of poverty? And so I think it's really easy intellectually to write about great investments, great contrarian investments afterwards, and be like, oh, it was so obvious that Amazon would do well, or the Bitcoin would do well. But I mean, I, I remember years ago, Bill Miller saying to me, you're crazy not to own Bitcoin. And it was, I was like, it's $8,000 per coin. How the hell can I pay $8,000 a coin for this ridiculous thing? And here we are, you know, five years later or whatever, and it's up fivefold since then. And um, mm -hmm. it's hard to, to go against the crowd and make these, at these times of tremendous murkiness, um, and make these kind of probabilistic bets where you don't really know the outcome. Um, 
it, it does require a particular type of temperament and intellect. And, and even someone, someone like Jeffrey Gundlach, who I write about, who's the, the, the often described as the king of bonds, he said to me, look, I'm, I'm wrong a third of the time. And, and Gundlach is not a renowned for his humility. I mean, he's a, you know, he knows how bright he is. And he's, and he's admitting that he's wrong a third of the time. So, so what he said to me, which had a big impact, is that he, he says to himself, well, what's the consequence if I'm wrong? So with anything, with anything that he buys, he's, he's assuming that he's going to be wrong. And he's saying, what's the consequence? So, so when I bought something like Alibaba, I'm like, well, I can see this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy owns it. And these are people who are brilliant at buying stuff. Yeah, it's a long list at, now. <laughs> at the point of maximum pessimism. Yeah, they're brilliant. But I'm also like, if I'm wrong, and it goes down 50%, 60%, 70%, 80%, I'll still be fine. And, and so it's not such a big position that, it, that it's ruinous. And I, I, I think that emphasis on avoiding ruin uh, is pretty important in a world where, where things like COVID can happen and where Chinese regulators can come in and, and crack down on, on one of the best run businesses in China. You kind of have to have this humility this knowledge that that the world is an uncertain place and, and you want to position yourself to survive. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I really like that. Um, well, I'm, I'm right there in that same boat with you on Alibaba, by the way, if that, I'm not sure oh, if that you gives you I'm any sorry. comfort at all, but um, <laughs> there you go. Um, yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's painful. So why do you think it's going to be okay? Tell, tell me why, reassure me in my moment of, uh, well, of, of gloom. Well, I must say the the first chapter in your book about cloning is one of the major reasons why I'm, why I'm in Alibaba. There's an extremely long list of, of other people far more intelligent yeah. than me that have bought Alibaba. So um, that that definitely gives me some comfort. Yeah. And and you're buying it at a discount to what they paid for it. So may, maybe, I, I hope it'll be okay. I, I, I assume it'll be fine. And when, when I think of something like that, again, to go back to the point we were discussing before about patients, I'm thinking, okay, maybe I'm wrong, but to have a stake in a major Chinese business that I can sit on for 10 years, that gives me a way of playing the Chinese economy, I'm kind of okay with that. And, and as part of a diversified portfolio anyway. And then likewise, I, I only own about three stocks, I think, but during, during the initial meltdown during COVID, um, I cloned something that Monish Pavright did, and I bought Seritage Growth Properties, which again, it's it's a it's a mall operator. So mm-hmm. here was a total meltdown in the the mall retail property industry, where the last thing you want to buy is a mall operator at a time when everyone's on lockdown at home and can't shop. And I'm just thinking, think of all those times throughout history where we always say, God, if only I'd bought an apartment in Midtown Manhattan then, or if only I'd bought an apartment, you know, in in West One in London, then it would be so amazing. And I was just thinking, this is one of those times where to buy a re- to buy a stake in a well managed company that that has all of these properties that they were turning into mixed use properties. And I remember Moni saying some of the some of the locations just unbelievable in places like California. And so I was just thinking, 10 years from now, am I going to regret this? And I was like, well, if it goes bankrupt, yes, but Buffett owns the debt. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, Berkshire Hathaway owns the debt and Buffett had a huge position in it personally. <clears throat> so I was like, probably it's going to survive. But it's again, it's it's hard and it's murky. And it, it very quickly doubled. And I was feeling super pleased with myself and incredibly smart. And, and, and then it, it got hit again. And so... You, I, I think you just have to you have to have the kind of temperament to be able to ride these things out for a long time, or mm-hmm. or just outsource it to other people who are smarter. And, and and what I do try to do on the whole is outsource it to people who are a smarter, b more more diligent, um, and c have better temperament. And 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 so I think just that recognition of your own limitations is 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 really key. And so I've been thinking about this this morning because. Bill Miller talked about some stock that I was like, God, that sounds just great. And, I'm, and there's definitely a part of me that's like, yeah, roll the dice, roll the dice, buy it for and hold it for 10 years. And then I'm like, but, but nah, maybe I'd do better just like leaving it to Guy Spear or someone like that to, to decide whether it's good instead of me 
me having to make the decision. And also, it, it's kind of emotionally draining in a way to invest in things that you don't truly understand. And and I think it's it's much easier. It, this is one of the problems I think with cloning is if you um, if you haven't done the work yourself, it's really hard to have the conviction to ride through these times when it's not working out. And and so I don't truly know whether I'm right with Seritage or Alibaba. And I, I, th I think it'll be fine, but it's, it's, I don't have the conviction that Monish has with Seritage where he bought 13% of the company or that uh, all these other great investors have with, with Alibaba. And so it's difficult. Cloning, cloning is a really powerful strategy where you're looking at what's smarter and wiser and more diligent people have figured out. But it, but there is this nuance that I think it's, I think it's hard if you don't, if you haven't done the work, it's hard to have that level of conviction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, you've named two stocks in a row. I have a pretty concentrated portfolio and I own two out of two so far. I know Seritage quite well. So, oh. um, but oh, I, well, that's I, good. But I, I completely agree. And Butcher like, is the third. So those are those are the three stocks. I mean, that's okay. all I. I mean, and then I have funds because mm -hmm. it, because. But I and so Berkshire I think is okay because it's like it's a long term holding and yeah. I think it'll it'll get me to the finish line. But I don't know. Yeah. Maybe with and I th I think Alibaba and Seritage will be fine. But 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 I, I to some extent I I remember Joel Tillinghast who I mentioned before from Fidelity said to me you want to stay away from your own ignorance. Mm -hmm. And actually Templeton said the same thing to me many years ago. Stay away from your own ignorance. And so, so Templeton was saying, you know, the biggest, the biggest problem in investing is emotion, but along with it is ignorance. It's just the pure stupidity of buying stuff that you don't understand. And I don't know, I think about that a lot. And so that, that's why I have this tremendous tension when it comes to buying individual stocks, because there's a part of me that's like, well, I have access to some of the greatest minds in the investing world and I can see what they're doing. And, you know, it's not, it's not insider information or anything, but it's like, literally, if you're studying people, you're like, okay, well, I can see that this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy, all bought Alibaba. And you're like, and they're really smart. You can see how contrarian they are and how smart and how right they've been in the past. But I'm, mm -hmm. but I'm deeply conscious of the fact that I'm not staying away from my own ignorance. And I, and I, so I'm very ambivalent about it. And I, and I think there's an emotional price to pay because I spent too much time then looking at the portfolio and wondering if I've made a mistake or wondering if I should buy more. And it's, um, it, I, it would be easier just to be clean and to say, nope, I'm, I'm outsourcing all of this. I, I, mm -hmm. but I, but we're not rational creatures, are we? Well, we try hard to be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Maybe exactly. we manage our irrationality. You, 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 feed, you, you allow yourself a little portion of irrationality. So these aren't yeah. huge bets on my part. They're, they're enough that I'll be happy if they work out, but not mm -hmm. so much that I'll be miserable if they fail. Yeah. Yeah. I like it. Yeah. Um, Seritage is, I, I mean, I, I agree completely on, on the cloning thing. It's, it's a great way to source ideas, but it's one thing to copy the idea and it's an entirely different thing to get to the same level of, of conviction as one of these super investors. I mean, with Seritage specifically, I've uh, teamed up with a couple of people to basically go through the portfolio and try to put a value on it and figure out like a liquidation mm -hmm. value and then compare that against the price and add in the Berkshire debt and so on. I think Matthew Peterson's done a pretty similar exercise with his fund where he's got projections on, you know, capital expenditure to do the redevelopments over the next five years or mm. so you know what are the rents going to look like out the other side and then you can start to make sense of, make a little bit more sense of the numbers and come to a conclusion on it yeah and you're probably competing with not that many people who think in such a long-term way so you're probably mm. competing with people who aren't thinking well in five ten years they'll have these amazing developments so it's yeah in a sense i i remember bill miller years ago talking to me about um time arbitrage so maybe it's a time arbitrage where you're like, well, yeah, if I'm happy to own Seritage for 10 years, it'll probably be great. But but I never know whether I can actually live up to that fantasy of being patient. Like like I have this image of myself as a super patient investor, but the reality is it's, it's pretty hard actually to sit on a stock for 10 years. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, we're completely on the same page with the time arbitrage thing. I think that's 
That's one of the main advantages that um, when you get something like Seritage served up to you that no one wants to own if they've been benchmarked quarterly, I think that's quite a quite a substantial advantage. Yeah. Um, yeah, there was a I, wonderful phrase that, that um, Jason Karp used for me, sorry to interrupt you, where he said, yeah. I don't quote this in the book, but he talked about the pain arbitrage, where he said mm-hmm. there were certain stocks that he was able to own because he was able to cope with the pain of them looking terrible for the next two quarters, whereas he said most hedge fund managers just couldn't couldn't handle owning something that looked so terrible for the next two quarters. I thought that was extraordinary that there's a there's a business where you have to really be worrying so much about how you look over the next over the next quarter. But I love that phrase, pain arbitrage. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've heard um, I've heard I think it was Bill Ackman talking talk not only about return on investment but also about. A return on brain damage with certain stocks like having these little yeah. small positions in your portfolio that take up far more of your brain power than they probably yeah. deserve <laughs> so um yeah. yeah i like that um so just to just to finish this off william i really appreciate your time mm. yeah um i'd like to get some some um questions from youtube for you if that's okay um just to sure i'll just try to, wrap to give this you speedier up. answers so we can we can <laughs> rattle through a bunch of them yeah, we've got uh, we've got quite a collection of them, but we'll see what we can get through. So, okay, um, first great. question, we, first question we have from YouTube is: uh, Are there any investors in particular that you would have liked to interview and write about, but didn't get the chance to? Yeah, I there there are a lot. I mean, there are certainly. I, I remember years ago asking Bill Miller who I should write about, and he said, "Look at Stanley Druckenmiller; he's an incredible investor." And mm-hmm. he'd be great to write about. And I, I think I wrote to Stanley Druckenmiller and he never replied. And then right. there were some people who um, are great investors who I interviewed on background, um, who are kind of legendary, but who didn't want to be quoted. That's always a little bit frustrating. Um, and I just hope they'll talk to me in future on, on, on the record. Um, mm-hmm. And then... And then there are always some that you haven't heard about. I, I was talking to, again, Ken Schubenstein recently, um, who's, who's given up the investment business, no longer a hedge fund manager and, and has become a neurologist, but, but still manages his own money very successfully, a really smart investor. And I, he, he was telling me there's this Chinese guy who he's friends with, who he said has a better record than Buffett. And he's like, he'll never talk to you. He'll never go on. He'll never be public. He just wouldn't court that kind of publicity, and that's always tantalizing. And that I think that was part of my fascination with Nick Sleep and, and Zach is that they never talked. And so when mm-hmm. when when I asked Monish for advice on who to uh, interview, Monish Power, I said, "Yeah, Nick Sleep's incredible. He you know he's got so much guts and does such deep deep analysis, and he's happy to own three or four stocks." And he said that's a lot of putting your nuts on the line. And, and, <laughs> and he said, but he'll never, he'll never talk. And, and once someone says, mm-hmm. he'll never talk, that, that's when you're like, God, I really want to talk to that guy. So well, I think one of the highlights of reporting this book actually was getting, getting to spend a lot of time with Nick and Zach and tell the story that had never been told. So, th- so there's definitely someone out there who none of us know who just has stunning returns and who I, I ought to be writing about. And so if you're, if your listeners, if there are people out there that you're like, I can't believe you haven't written about this guy, write about this person. Mm-hmm. And particularly, I'm always fascinated by one of the great difficulties for a writer is finding the greatest women investors, the greatest minority investors, the greatest Indian, Chinese investors, Latin Americans. And I, I, and, and you always wonder, like, is it because I just have such a narrow mind that I'm not finding these people? And so if there are people out there that, that you guys see that you're like, this, this is an incredible person, please let me know. And I, I'm, I'm particularly interested in people who are not just incredible money makers, but actually you can learn from them about how to think better and how to live better. I, I, the, the, there's nothing hugely admirable about being able to make enormous pots of money um, by placing mm-hmm. bets um, on stocks. It's a, it's a neat party trick and, uh, you know, it has some tremendous benefits. Um, but I, but I, if, if you know of people that you think are wise and really thoughtful and can teach us stuff about how to live and how to think, um, I'm, I'm always on the lookout for them. 
Yeah, well, someone um, I've just come across in the past few weeks, actually, I'm not sure if you've heard of them before, but they're the Chandler brothers from here in New Zealand, actually. Um, And they are very private people, but they have throughout their careers gone into basically beaten up, bombed out, obscure markets in various parts of the world. And by all accounts, by all accounts Hmm. made ridiculously high returns. And I believe they're based out of Singapore now. So it's, they're very hard to find oh, information on, but if if you could ever yeah. get onto them, uh, then that would certainly be a good one. Yeah, that would be great. That, that's intriguing. Thank you. Mm. Yeah. Um, right. Next up, we've got a question from Andrew Latenda. Uh, Andrew actually has a YouTube channel as well. Uh, he asks, uh, what books of any genre are your uh, favorites and, and any must reads that you'd recommend for people? Yeah, I, I mean, my book, my room is just sort of covered in stuff. Well, let me look at what's on this pile nearest to my uh, to my desk at the moment. Um, there's a guy I read recently um, called Michael Singer, who I, I read on the recommendation of an excellent fund manager called Yen Liao, who's a very smart, very thoughtful guy. And Yen was recommending a book called The Surrender Experiment. Uh, by Michael Singer. It's a very, very interesting book where Singer, (laughs) he's a remarkably bright guy who's a sort of meditation guru and kind of spiritual guru, but who also ran an immensely successful company. And it's very philosophical and spiritual, the book, because he he basically is writing about a 40-year experiment that he's had where he kind of surrenders to whatever the world, the universe, whatever you, God, whatever, however you want to think of it is presenting to him. And so he'll suddenly discover, he buys a piece of land, for example, and he'll suddenly discover that someone's building a house on his land. And he's like, what the hell? And he goes at me and this woman is like, yeah, well, I wanted to build a house near you because, you know, you have this amazing meditation practice and I want to come to your Saturday morning meditations and stuff. And, and he's like, oh, okay. So he goes and helps her build the house. And, and then he discovers people want to build a monastery on his land. You know, he, and so he just sort of, he throws himself into whatever comes into his life in a, in an extraordinary way. So instead of, instead of saying no to everything and being like, no, no, I can't do that. I'm not going to do that. He, he embraces everything that life presents to him and does it with a kind of intensity and obsession with quality. Um, that's, that's fascinating. Um, mm-hmm. I really enjoyed that. I, I listened to the audio book of that recently and he, he reads it, Michael Singer. Um, I think, I think David Hawkins, who I write a lot about in Richer, Wiser, Happier has played a really large part in my life over the last few years. So he wrote books like Power Versus Force, which Manish Pavarai recommends, um, and had a big impact on people like Guy Spear and Arnold Vandenberg. Um, and Power versus Force, which is probably the best known of Hawkins' books, talks about this idea of certain certain qualities and characteristics and type of types of behavior have a what he would call a a, a, a kind of higher calibration. It's as as Arnold Annenberg would say, they 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 vibrate at a certain level, and so if you're truthful, for example, um, people sense whether you're truthful. And if you're lying, dishonest, even lying to yourself, people will sense that. And even if it's subconscious. And so this had a huge effect on Manish Pavarai because he decided, well, after reading that, I'm just going to tell the truth. And so, Mm -hmm. for example, during the financial crisis, his fund was down something like 67% peak to trough. And and he said, um, I went to my shareholders and I said, um, this, the reason we've had a terrible period isn't because of the market. It's because I made this dumbass mistake, this dumbass mistake, and this dumbass mistake. And he said, mm-hmm. almost nobody redeemed. And so that had a huge impact on him. And so I then read um, Power versus Force. And I look at it and I'm like, well, yeah, so truthfulness is clearly really important. But actually, that's, that's just Monish's reading of the book. And it's pretty clear that also these these virtues like compassion, unconditional love, mercy, kindness, they all calibrate incredibly highly. Whereas things like um, shame and guilt 
and anger calibrate incredibly low. And, and that was really fascinating to me because I think a lot of us in the West were big on shame and guilt. And it made me think, well, so one of the ways that I've tried to succeed throughout my life is by beating myself up for behaving badly in this way or for being lazy or unproductive or stuff. So, so my kind of inner voice has tended to be kind of brutal and, and self-flagellating. And it kind of works in a, in a way, but it's a really miserable way to live. And, and I think one of the things that that clarified for me was that actually instead of instead of going big on shame and guilt and things like that and worry all these things that calibrate very low um maybe i should try to go bigger on kindness and compassion and love and mercy and things like that that all sound a little bit hokey but i think make for a much happier and more resilient life and so that had a kind of profound Im impact on me and then I started reading other books by Hawkins, um, some of which are really mystical, um, which I which I love, but which Monish has less time for because Monish <laughs> yeah. is more rational and, and less mystical than I am. Um, and then there's a there's a late book that he wrote that's extremely pragmatic, which is called Letting Go, and I found that an immensely helpful book. And and Hawkins Hawkins had the biggest psychotherapy practice in, in New York City, but then became a kind of enlightened mystic. And, and I think people kept asking him, so how do we deal with our, with our wayward emotions? And he, and he said, um, and so he basically writes this book that had, provides this mechanism for letting go, for dealing with your, your negative thought patterns, your negative emotions. And I found that immensely helpful. And it's and it's very, it's very consistent with what say Tibetan Buddhists teach. And I spent a lot of time studying Tibetan Buddhism, among other things. And and what Hawkins is basically saying when he describes the the letting go mechanism is he's he's saying instead of trying to suppress these emotions or judge them or beat yourself up about them or try to change them or project onto someone else um, to, to avoid looking at them. Just abide with them, look at them, be aware of them without trying to change them, without trying to judge them. And he said that that approach basically means that the energy behind them dissipates. And so his view is that the resistance to these negative thought patterns or emotions is what keeps them strong. And that when you let go of judging them, um, it kind of releases them. And there's a there's a wonderful course that I've been doing online called, called Fully Being, which is taught by this um, this great Tibetan Buddhist called Sokni Rinpoche. And, and he has a very similar process that, that he calls handshake practice, where he says when, when, when these patterns come up or these emotions come up, he says that the kindness is non-judging. And so he says, he calls them your, your beautiful monsters, these patterns. And so when they come up, instead of trying to, trying to change them or deny them or repress them, you say, well, hi there, and you, you handshake them. And then the intensity behind them dissipates. And I, I, I'm sorry to go on about this at such length, but I think it's profoundly important because I think for people like us who tended to be fairly cerebral, we grew up going to schools that rewarded us for doing really well in exams and being really bright and getting into top institutions and stuff, but they never taught us how to deal with our emotions. And so for me in middle age, one of the things I'm trying to do is actually become a little wiser in dealing with my beautiful monsters. And, mm -hmm. and I was having this discussion with Guy Spear today, who, who's, um, in London this week, and and we were talking about exactly this that there we we were talking about things that make us jealous, for example, and instead of just and there was something where he told me about something that he was jealous of, and I and I was like, well, that's one of the beautiful monsters, and I was I was sharing something that I uh, that was troublesome for me, and and in a way, it's a wonderful release to be able to acknowledge these things without trying to change them. Um, but in some strange way, they do change, they dissipate when you're not denying them. And, and so I would really encourage people to read the Letting Go book, the, the 
Power versus Force book by David Hawkins. But I actually, if if you're mystically inclined, I also really love some of the more esoteric books that he he wrote. Like um, they have, they have all these crazy names like I the the letter colon reality and subjectivity or you know they're, they're, they're people can message me and i'll tell them which which ones i particularly like but they're they're pretty amazing books because it's mm-hmm. basically this guy who i think pretty much became enlightened and then is telling you so here's here's how the world is structured and um so it, this it, it's hard for someone like monish who's very rational and he he just looks at this stuff and i think he's like yeah i, I don't have time for that whereas <laughs> i i'm sort of mystically inclined and i'm 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 very happy to go down this rabbit hole yeah, nice. No, I appreciate the recommendations. Um, yeah. We actually have several questions on the topic of Nick Sleep's ASOS investment. Um, so mm. I'm not I'm not sure how much you know about the specifics around this, but uh, a lot of the questions basically are around the timing. So I understand Nick Sleep sold half his Amazon position around 2018 from memory. Was he sitting on cash for a while before he actually made that ASOS investment or did it did he order yeah, roll into that's, ASOS that's immediately? That's how I remember it, that he was sitting for a while. Then, then, But I, I'm sufficiently vague on the details that I don't mm-hmm. want to mislead people. But I, I, know, I know that he had owned ASOS before, yeah. dur- during the Nomad period. They owned ASOS and did very well on it. And then if I remember rightly, and I'm probably misleading people, so ignore anything that I'm saying. I, mm-hmm. It may have gone private and then gone public again. And I have a feeling maybe he invested when it was going public. Um, and then invested more. So, so I, I'm, I'm not sure I'm being very helpful here, except to say that it, it, it had the same sort of characteristics of these other businesses that Nick loved. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so if you look at that chapter of the book, Nick and Zach's Excellent Adventure, there's a long discussion of this, this, this model scale economies shared. Yeah. Um, these, these companies that, that have, tremendous benefits of scale that they then share with mm-hmm. um, their customers. And, and, and so it was kind of an embodiment of that. And what was curious was Zach, Zach had a similar investment that was boohoo.com. There was another, that was another retailer, um, but they had very similar, they had very similar holdings. And, and when I talked to Nick a few weeks ago, um, it was clear that he still had most of his money in the same four stocks as ever, which were um, uh, Amazon, still the biggest position, Costco, Berkshire Hathaway, and um, uh, an ASOS. And he, he had a he had a private investment in a in a company with one of the um, famous uh, CEOs that he had invested with successfully before. So there were a couple mm-hmm. of smaller things, but that was that was the that was the biggest stuff, and. I've I've asked him over the last year or so. We, we've had a couple of conversations, and there was one point where somebody unbelievably smart had expressed their skepticism about Berkshire before it had the recent run up. And I and I talked to Nick about it, and Nick was like, mm, you know, look, the culture's great. I I'm I'm betting on the culture. They're extraordinarily long term, and I thought that was just really interesting that he could just. He, he had this ability to simplify and just say, no, they're, they're very focused on a, a good ultimate destination and behaving in an extraordinarily long-term manner. And that's fine by me. And mm-hmm. so he's playing a very long, simple game where he's betting on companies that are likely to have a superior destination because of their culture. But I think also you have to be aware of the fact that he's not playing the game day to day in the way that he was before. And so he's he's simplified and has has most of his money in these four stocks. So he just knows eventually we'll do great. And then and then then Zach likewise was like every six months I open my stock portfolio and I think what would Nick do? I think Nick would do nothing. And then and then I don't change anything and I go back to doing other stuff. And so they're both really focused on on giving the money back to society to to a great extent. And so Nick was really fascinated when I talked to him a few weeks ago. Um, about things like, should I be focusing on early intervention in children's lives? Is that is that the place where I can deliver maximum social value by by helping kids early in their lives? Because that's uh, if you do that, the 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 rewards are so enormous. And so, what was interesting is it was the same. 
it was the same emphasis in his philanthropy as in his investing, which is looking at things in a very long term way, where you're saying, what's a desirable destination? And what inputs will get us to a desirable destination? And, and so the, the, the real lesson here is not one about ASOS. Um, it's, I, I know everyone always wants a stock pick. <laughs> yeah. I think it's much less about that. And it's much more about the enormous advantage that accrues to you if you're truly long term mm -hmm. in a world where almost everybody else is short term. And most people will hear what we've just said and will ignore it totally and just want the stock pick. But I, I remember Peter Kaufman, who's very close to Charlie Munger, once talking about how everyone would come to the Daily Journal meeting and, and, and hearing Charlie talk and how they all pretend to be these long term investors, but actually they really just want stock picks. You know, like it's really hard to be long term. And, yeah. and, and, and yet you look at people like Buffett and Munger and Nick Sleep and they're, they're just that that's such a powerful lesson to be long term. And so I, I would say the real key is not the stock pick, but focus, focus on businesses that you really believe have, have a superior long term destination and are doing the things that will get them there. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that I, I think you have to wonder about a company like Amazon is, do they have the same culture as Costco? Are they, are they treating people as decently? Uh, are they treating their suppliers as decently or their employer, their employees as decently as, uh, as Costco and Costco clearly, I think has a superior culture. Um, mm -hmm. so, it's, you know, so there's an advantage there in some ways, but Amazon is clearly an unbe unbelievable, um, machine as well. But it's a, yeah. that's, that's, that's the real lesson is to think more in the, in the style of Nick and Zach with this focus on, on the long term, on deferred gratification, on quality, um, on sharing, because really that whole model of scale economy is shared taps into a really important universal truth, which is, um, there's a tremendous benefit to sharing. And so these companies like Costco were built on sharing and that actually has really powerful ramifications for your own life. It, it, there's, there's more longevity when there's sharing built into what you're doing. And, and that's the case, whether you're managing money, whether you're giving away money as a, as a decent charitable human being, or as a big philanthropist, but it's a, this, is a, th those, those are the real values that you want to learn from Nick and Zach. It's, it's, it's much more important than the stock pick. I, I, I don't want to sound like, like sort of a proselytizer here, but actually focus, focus on those questions, like those issues, like quality, deferred gratification and destination analysis. And that that's actually going to change your life ra rather than mm -hmm. rather than just cloning one stock pick. Yep. Yep. Completely agree. Well, let, let's maybe do one more question. Um, this is this is one I'm going to be intrigued to hear the answer on, because I know you've been um, you've been sort of deep in the weeds, putting together Ritualizer Happier for several years to, to get this mm -hmm. to get this book out there and into the world. Um, and the question basically is, uh, are there any plans for a Ritualizer Happier 2.0? Huh. Yeah, I, I, I'm thinking about it, and I'm thinking about a, doing something more audio oriented, where I'm just talking to great investors mm -hmm. um, in depth. Um, and I don't really know. I'm, I'm kind of postponing the decision in a way, but I'm, I'm gathering material. But I. I definitely, I definitely am gathering notes on who the most interesting people would be to write about. Uh, so, so there is something there, but this is one of the things I was talking to Guy Spear about this morning as we, we were saying, there's a, there's a pressure to keep writing books for people who've written books, but then there's also a danger that you end up becoming kind of a bore because you don't have that much more to say. Yeah. And so I think. I think it's really interesting when you look at someone like Josh Waitskin, for example, whose book, The Art of Learning, I talk about in my book. I think it's a terrific book. He wrote this one book that's kind of great. And then he's more or less gone silent. You hear him once in a while on a podcast with someone like, um, uh, um, uh, well, he's, he's done three or four podcasts that I think have been kind of extraordinary. His, his, his interviews with Tim Ferriss are always really, really interesting. Um, but I think one of the reasons why he's so great 
is that he's not written four or five books. And so I, I sort of worry about that. Like, like I want to know, I, I, I don't want to just be writing stuff because I can, mm-hmm. or I, I want to actually <laughs> share stuff that's of value. I mean, I, I think yeah. part of the reason why Richard Wise Happier has resonated is because I was, I was behaving as if this was the one book that I would ever do. And so I was saying, what can I keep squeezing in there? What more can I share? What, what will really help people? And so I was really, I was really thinking of it as if God forbid I keel over, will I have created one thing that I look, you know, that, that I could look back on at the end of my life and say, I'm proud of that. I did something that where I, I really shared everything that I, not everything, but the most important stuff that I had learned from the greatest investors. And so I was playing for keeps. I wasn't trying to say, let me save this for the next thing. Yeah. And, and I, I was really trying to put in as much value as possible. And, and, and so <laughs> your, your, your listeners will be able to look at it and judge whether I failed miserably. But that's, <laughs> that's what I was trying to do. And I, I, think, I think people sense in David Hawkins terms, they smell whether you're just out for yourself or whether you're actually trying to share stuff that's worthwhile. So that that's what I'm worrying about with the next book. I don't want to hurry into it just because there's momentum. Mm-hmm. Yeah, nice. No, so I um I sometimes feel a little bit of the same pressure with with even just with YouTube content. I don't want to be putting out videos just for the sake of putting out videos. <laughs> I want to make sure it's valuable. And yeah. and yeah, you've you've definitely ticked that box with Richard Wiser Happier. I um I forget who I was saying this to, but I sort of view Richard Wiser Happier like you're I'm almost like a fan of the sport of investing hmm. and Richard Wiser Happier is like a highlight reel of the all time, you know, great moments of that sport ah. is kind of how I view it. So it's it is fantastic. Ah, thanks. Yeah, I think for for me the the idea that I write about in that chapter on Nick and Zach that really had an enduring impact on me is a simple filter of quality, of being obsessed with the idea of quality. Yeah. And it sounds so vague and nebulous, but if you actually decide I'm going to commit to quality, whatever that means, it affects everything from the way you behave, hopefully in your relationships, although we all screw up totally and do dumb things, but, you know, lose our temper or whatever it might be. Um, but the way you treat your business partner, the, 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 the way you behave in the supermarket, whatever it might be, what projects you approach. And I, there was an email that I think I quote in the book where I had written to Nick Sleep talking about how long I was taking on his chapter. And it was kind of torturing me. I think the chapter took me about five months, which probably means I'm underestimating it, it took even longer. <laughs> and and he wrote back and he said, um, he said that the, the it's really important to focus on quality because that's where all of the peace and satisfaction lies. And that had a real impact on me. That, that idea that when you try to focus on quality, that's where the peace and satisfaction lies is really profound. And, and if you think of all of the pressure that we have day to day to do stuff now fast and to be ultra productive and to, to go shallow in many different areas, I think one of the great lessons from people like Nick Sleep is the ability to go deep and high quality and do less, but make it count. And I think, I think, you know, it's sort of what we were talking about with Seritage before, where there's not much competition to invest in, in businesses for 10 years. You're not really, you know, that's, that's not where most of the competition is. So maybe there are real opportunities there. I think it's the same if you're really focused on quality and you're really focused on being long-term, it's not a lot of competition in that game. And so maybe this is just my excuse for being slow and plodding and unproductive, but I sort of, I increasingly want to focus on, on being long-term, high quality, trying to do stuff of enduring value in a, in a world where there's more and more stuff that's shallow and quick. And and there is, there is definitely a lot of self justification there for the fact that I'm probably lazy and slow. But I um uh, I I would encourage people at least to think about that question about how do you apply things like this idea of of quality or the art of subtraction of removing complexity, removing things that are short term, deferring gratification, really focusing on what matters most and what you're best at, 
and what has enduring value. And that, that for me has, has been a very helpful shift in my way of thinking. I think Nick, Nick sleep really helped me to think through. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. Well, William, I really appreciate your time. I think that's a fantastic place to, to wrap it up. Um, just before we, just before we uh, stop the, stop the episode recording here, um, if anyone's interested in grabbing a copy of the book, um, richer, wiser, happier, or if they want to follow along with what you're doing, I know I follow you on Twitter, but I'm not sure if there's any, anywhere else you want to plug, right. um, plug away, please. Sure. I, you're, you're welcome to connect with me on LinkedIn, um, which I, I use I use pretty frequently. And I really do try to reply to people on LinkedIn if they if they message me. Uh, welcome to connect with me on Twitter, where I, I think I'm William Green 72. And again, I try to reply to people. I'm not always great at it, but I do try to reply. Um, my website is um, WilliamGreenWrites.com, which mm -hmm. is... Um, entirely cloned from Michael Lewis, whose website is michaellewiswrites.com. Nice. And, uh, and his probably is way better than mine. So you, you should also visit his. Um, and he's a very good, very good writer. <laughs> um, so yeah, you're welcome to message me there. Um, and again, I, I'm happy to keep in touch with people. If, if there are things that you read or people I should write about or things that have influenced you, happy to hear about it. I, 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 I'm not coming at this as some kind of sage who's pretending that I figured this stuff out. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a fellow traveler kind of trying to f figure out my way through the fog, um, blindfolded. And, um, and so if you come across stuff that you're like, yeah, this is really cool. This had a really big impact on me and mm -hmm. you should look into this. I'm, I'm, I'm always happy to hear, hear from you. And, and likewise, I, I, I've, I've tried to share book recommendations and stuff like that. And so, um, and, and there are lots of podcasts and I think some of them, although I'm behind on this, I, I, I gathered on my website. So I've tried to keep a few articles and podcasts and things like that. So, so yeah, if there's, I, I, I hope there's stuff that you'll find valuable there, but, but I think the, the real thing is to, to go to the book, not, not cause I'm trying to hawk copies of it, but go to the book, especially if you have it already and internalize a few of the ideas that have a big impact on you. So when you find an idea that resonates, these are not my ideas, they're ideas that I'm stealing from the, the smartest investors in the world. Um, if you find an idea that really resonates with you, like deferred gratification or um, compounding or cloning or uh, simplicity, any of these ideas, avoiding stupidity, these key ideas that, that I talk about in the book, go big on it. That That's the really key thing. It's about... It's, it's not about reading, reading the book and ticking it off your list and then moving on to the next thing. It's, it's actually about taking a few of these ideas that really resonate for you and making them a part of your life and the way you see the world. And so if, if you take something like Munger's idea of simply reducing standard stupidities and you really take it seriously, it'll actually change your life. And, and so that's, that's what I would encourage you to do is, 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 is again, go deep, like find a, f find a few things that really matter to you that really resonate and go deep on them. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Yeah. Take a simple idea and take it seriously, I guess, as, as Charlie Munger says. Exactly. So that's a, that's a fantastic place exactly. to wrap it up. And I will, uh, I'll leave all of those links down the show notes for anyone listening in that wants to, um, follow along with what William's up to. So William, I really appreciate your time and, uh, thanks for joining me. Thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you so much for watching another episode of the Investing with Tom podcast. If you did enjoy it, please remember to hit like and also subscribe to the channel so that you can see future podcast episodes as soon as they go live.